before I start the panel, I'd like to uh, recognize that uh, I, when I did the introduction for uh, Dr. McGrew, I had mentioned the, the start of the Coast Lab and, and my colleague uh, Sam Wagstaff who helped with that. And I now see Sam is here. So Sam, identify yourself right there. Okay. So Sam is, uh, was here on the faculty before I arrived and uh, was one of my co-conspirators in the early days of uh, coast and security. So uh, thank you for finding your way here today, Sam. <clears throat> OK, we have a panel session, uh, fireside chat, uh, with three distinguished individuals here. Um, and I'm not going to go spend time introducing them. They, they have bios in the uh, program that you can look at. We'll uh, go through a moment, let them uh, state who they are so you can match them up with the bios. Uh, but then we're going to launch into some questions. And if um, after the first question or two, if any of you have some you'd like to pose to the panel, please queue up at the microphone and we'll take your questions as jumping off points for some of our discussion. So gentlemen, if you would Zach, we'll start with you. If you just say a couple words about who you are. Sure. I'm, uh, I'm Zach Tudor. I'm the Associate Lab Director for National and Homeland Security Science and Technology uh, at the Idaho National Lab. Uh, I only add the, uh, the science and technology when I'm in academic settings. And, uh, <laughs> normally they just say National Homeland Security because uh, we are um, at INL, uh, the, uh, the nation's nuclear energy lab. Uh, we are an engineering lab, um, you know, primarily, but of course, you know, we, we take all phases of a science. Uh, and there we are primarily uh, known, at least in my group, uh, for being the industrial control security kind of center of excellence, uh, both here in, in the U.S. and, uh, and uh, kind of abroad as well. So um, some of the things that uh, David was talking about earlier, I'm thinking, okay, how can I apply that to, uh, to the physics on the shop floor or, uh, or for, for uh, energy systems, et cetera. Um, so uh, I'm a, a prior submariner, as we'll, uh, we have a 50% submarine uh, panel up here as well. Um, you know, officer enlisted, so he can talk about all of the, the, the fine, wonderful times and great food he had, and I can talk about the hard work. Um, so so and, uh, with that, I think that's almost enough. And, and you look familiar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm David McGrew, and uh, I think you heard enough already about me. Uh, Tommy Gardner. I, first, I'd like to thank David for your talk. Uh, that was very well uh, presented, uh, much more organized than I'm going to be tomorrow. So I, you set a standard. That, uh, and, and Zach, thanks for your work in the submarine force, because uh, you're right, the officers are told to keep your hands in your pocket. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Leave it to the people who know what they're doing to make the ship work. But uh, it's nice to, to have a, a fellow bubblehead to, on the panel. Uh, my job in uh, daytime is, uh, is the CTO for HP Federal, and that's the federal division of HP Incorporated. So we do the print, the PCs, the laptops, workstations, and uh, the 3D print for industrial security. We're very uh, concerned about the security of our 3D printers. Uh, we're into uh, microfluidics and some of the testing of metal devices is new. Uh, I'm focused primarily, my research area is the uh, quantum internet and a new generation internet that's uh, just now available from new techniques coming out of the quantum world. Uh, my uh, nighttime job, I teach at uh, Catholic University, so I've got a, a foot in the door in academia as an adjunct uh, teaching uh, uh, cybersecurity software programming, and this semester, the digital supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, interesting subject. I'm learning more than the students are, but that's, that's part it. of being a professor. That's right. <laughs> Uh, and for those of you who didn't guess, I'm Gene Spafford, and I do many things, uh, including moderating this wonderful uh, group here. And I'm going to start off with uh, a question to hear your responses, because you come from a, a variety of different perspectives. Uh, what's really been in the news a lot, uh, uh, deservedly so, over the, uh, the last four or five weeks, has been the, um, the Russian incursion into Ukraine. And many, many stories there, many unfortunate stories. But uh, one that sort of hits to our domain is in the area of, of sort of cyber war um, that many were proclaiming was going to be an issue, uh, that the Russians have been preparing this for some uh, period of time. They have a lot of expertise, both within 
their, uh, the, the GRU and the SVR uh, and FSB and the criminal groups that they control. But we've been sort of surprised not to have seen much happen. Although CISA and others have been warning us that it's imminent, it's coming, it's big. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested in hearing from your perspectives, why haven't we seen something? And are we going to see something? So uh, I'll start with this. And I, Zach probably knows a lot more about the details, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, I don't have any of the inside intelligence. Uh, when you go to HP, they take away your clearances. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, but when I was a young lieutenant commander in the Pentagon, uh, I was assigned to go through all the top secret, special category, special programs, and determine which ones we needed to keep special, which ones we didn't. And there's about a 20% upcharge for any program if you're going to keep it under wraps. And it's not that the Russians don't have capability. We know they have capability. Uh, there's no doubt about that. You have to choose when are you going to use it. And uh, we used a lot of our special capability in uh, Desert Storm. You know, things that have been in wraps, in holdback. Uh, because once you use it, then people know what you've got. And they're able to make counters against it. I think that's what's happening now. I think the Russians think we've got control of the situation, whether they do or not. And uh, I think they're saying we don't want to let the world know what tricks we have up our sleeves. And so they're holding back. Uh, if they get to a desperate position where all of a sudden the tide's turning and there's 100 scenarios that could create that, uh, that's when you likely to see them pull the, you know, pull the open the bag and Pandora's box begin to open. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go, and, and fortunately, I'm on the road so much, I don't get to, you know, read most of the intel, so, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of in the same uh, boat as you are. But, you know, on one level, I'm thinking that uh, perhaps Russia doesn't want to open up a second front, yeah. um, and that's what cyber would be now if we uh, talk about that. So I, I think that we were all expecting, as, as Spaff said, um, lots of different, uh, you know, things, whether it would be um, some, some different kind of uh, attacks, and not even, you know, novel attacks against the U.S. to keep us busy, you know, while they're doing things in Ukraine. Or, I mean, you know, we, we've seen some minor things happen in, in Ukraine and, and without a lot of attribution yet. But, but I think that um, that would be seen by the U.S. and, and the NATO allies and, 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 uh, and the European Union as an escalation of a different kind. And it would, uh, you know, give them, you know, some different yeah. things to have to worry about. And I think they're trying to save that for, uh, for a rainy day. Well, I have no doubt that Cybercom's ready to respond. It's just yeah. they're waiting for the right indicator of compromise or yeah. the, the right uh, uh, trigger that says you've crossed the line. And yeah, I know uh, when, when I first got into this job uh, in about uh, 2016, um, you know, a lot of my folks had uh, just been getting back from Ukraine after the 2015 attack and then the, uh, the 2016 attack, and I was saying, you know, gee, I didn't have to do a lot of my own business development, you know, because, you know, back at that time, you know, there was an adversary that wasn't named was doing it. I said, I'm going to send him a fruit basket or something. Um, so, uh, um, but, um, you know, for, for many years, you know, all of us here had to convince, you know, people either in government or industry or others um, that cyber threat was real. Right, and that it was worth investing in. I, you know, that discussion is finally over, I think. So that's, that's the, uh, the only good news. Um, do you have anything to add to this, David? Uh, um, you know, I, I agree with what's been said, right? Um, there, we might find out that something is, we might find out about Russian cyber activity after, you know, in, in due time, right? The, the thing that stands out in my mind is the, uh, you know, during Crimea, there were, uh, there was uh, malware that had infected uh, smartphones of uh, Ukrainian um, artillerymen. And they, had, they were all using a particular app because, it, I, I forget what it did, right? But there was some app they were all using. And somebody figured that out and was able to target them that way. And, and that didn't come out for a month, or at least. After, it came out after the fact, right? So they're, they're, uh, I, I think the main point is that, you know, you know, not all the cards are on the table yet, but we, we might find out something in time. Well, I think uh, one of the interesting uh, possible outcomes of this, you were saying finally everybody's aware. Well, it, it seems to me very similar to, um, well, going back certainly to the Y2K, um, is you have a lot of warnings, disasters coming, <clears throat> and then nothing happens, and everybody goes, well, why do we get excited about that? Why should we be investing when nothing happens and we're warned? 
that's a natural consequence, certainly, for those who control the budgets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a good consequence, but it's a natural one. So if nothing does happen because they're holding back, how do we keep the pressure up in government and industry for people to be aware and to actually put the controls in place? Uh, this administration is doing a really good job of putting cyber security up in the forefront. And the uh, May 12th executive order, I never can remember the number, but it's uh, 47012 <laughs> or something like that, uh, really spun a lot of action. And, you know, with agencies responsible for the action and deadlines. There's a 90-day deadline, a 100-day deadline, a six-month, a one-year. And, and we're coming up on, you know, these six-month period. Uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting how that uh, a lot of the work that's gone on realize that, hey, we, we've talked about this, now's the time to take action and, and do something about it. I don't think we're going to see any lessening of cyber importance, uh, primarily because of ransomware. Uh, those attacks have been primarily at vulnerable locations, the hospitals, schools, municipalities. Uh, I think you're going to see a broadening of those attacks if we don't work on collective defense and identification of who's doing what to who uh, better. And there's ways to do that. Uh, uh, but if that's not stopped, then everybody's going to feel threatened. And it's what you don't know that creates action. It's all the things that you, you fear but don't have any idea how to analyze is, puts that risk equation in, in an imbalance. Well, that ties right in with what David was talking about in, in his remarks earlier, uh, is having that visibility. Well, uh, no, you know, if I might, you know, I, yeah. I would also add, um, you know, both the ransomware and others, but, um, you know, so Russia's not the only adversary in the digital domain. <laughs> Um, and I think that a lot of things that are happening around the world, um, you, know, you know, increased competition with China, um, you, know, you know, there's still, you know, terrorist threats in various places that are manifesting themselves in, in cyber as well. Um, you know, once again, I think that at least the, uh, the guys that uh, hold the, the purse strings, yeah. um, you know, are aware of what's going on. And, and as we are changing, um, whether we want to onshore or friendshore manufacturing, looking at supply chains. There are a lot of things in our domain that are, that are not going to go away, you know, if there's no, you know, big cyber event uh, as a result of this, and, and which I'm really kind of hoping for, right? Zach, exactly. you, you mentioned purse strings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really the key. Uh, you know, there, there's intelligence community that are looking into things because that's what they get paid to do, find, find out things, know things that other people don't know or things that... Uh, other countries think are unknowable or we've protected. I, that, that's what they get paid to do. But there's the criminal activity, and that gets to the ransomware. Uh, they're in it for the money. Uh, most of them. Yeah, yeah, most of them. Some are paid by state actors, and so that gets in the intelligence world. Or, uh, and the economic issues of intellectual property theft is always out there. Uh, when I was a senior at the Naval Academy, uh, we have what's called a Forrestal lecture, where they bring in luminaries to kind of teach us what the world's about and, you know, make us think a little bit. And I remember my senior year, they brought in a science fiction writer named Robert Heinlein. Now, some of you may have actually read Heinlein's books, a uh, famous writer. I read every book he'd had when I was a teenager. And so to see him 22 years old at the Naval Academy, it was like, you know, just, I, I was excited to go. Usually you sleep through these lectures. I'm excited <laughs> to be there. And uh, the last book Heinlein wrote, and, and Heinlein was there because he was a Naval Academy graduate. You know, where else would you have expected him to go to school? But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he's dreaming these far out things because that's what you do at the Academy. You just, <laughs> you, you just try to think of the future. Uh, he wrote the book, The Moon is a Strange Mistress, the last book he wrote. And in that book, he talked about a dialogue between a mother and a five-year-old son. Now, if any of you have had five-year-old children, you, you know how they, uh, they tend to be inquisitive. And uh, the, the boy was asking his mom, every time she asked, uh, gave an answer, he would say, well, why? She said, well, this is why it happened, and this is why we're doing it. Well, why is that? And, and you know the routine. After 15 whys, you get tired of answering. And the, the response is, just because. And so she's going like that. And uh, the way Heinlein describes this dialogue, which is common to most people with children, is that uh, finally the mother got exasperated and said, Johnny, if you want to know the answer why to any question, 
the answer is always money. And you start to think about it, and somehow you can go down enough questions, and you'll get to where the purse strings matter. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, Thanks, Zach. No problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that there have been some major operations that have leaked over into the private sphere. So just prior to the invasion, there was an attack against satellite communications mm -hmm. that leaked out into Europe and uh, partly to North America that permanently apparently bricked satellite receivers that are in use in things like um, windmills for solar generation mm -hmm. and some positioning. And a few years earlier, attack against Ukraine, the NotPetya yeah. uh, malware that, uh, again, went out and damaged systems in a number of places. So it's, non-combatants definitely have to worry about this. It's a question of how do we, how do we get them to, to realize this? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the executive order. Are there other things that we can be doing to get the community at large to understand that even if they're not directly in the crosshairs, they have the potential for significant losses. Well, you, you mentioned the uh, not pet you, and, and it gets to the law of unintended consequences. Yes. That was never intended to get out and damage all the companies that it was. That wasn't why it was written. But nobody thought to that second and third order effects, or what uh, you could call in a military sense, collateral damage. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where you have to look through. If we're going to use offensive cyber, and we have capability, uh, Ash Carter was a Secretary of Defense that first brought that out in the open. Uh, we have capability, and I suspect it's better than anywhere else in the world. It's, have we chosen to use it in limited cases, limited ability? But we've got to know what's the unintended consequences, what's, what is going to happen if it's released, what else is it going to do? And that's what I'm concerned about is have we really thought through this or have we taken test of tools we're going to use if the right circumstances ex exist, and make sure they don't get out of control. So, well, we had that leak of the CIA toolkit that's uh, been widely, it was Mr. eternal Mr. blue. Uh, yeah. Mr. Snowden did a good job of yeah. handing over the keys to the kingdom. Yeah, that and one was not clearly him, but, but no, nonetheless. No, but it's but, but, you know, so, but one thing is though, um, you talk about un unintended uh, consequence or, or just uh, unexpected success. You know, take um, the colonial pipeline attack. Yeah. It was an attack against uh, IT systems. Um, that ended up um, uh, bleeding over into the operations of a pipeline um, right. because of the reliant, no one really knew that they were that reliant on IT. Um, and, and the thing was, it's like, well, there's nothing wrong with the OT system, um, but we're not sure, so let's shut it down just to make sure nothing's bad, right? And so now we provide a denial of service attack as a preventive measure um, based on a, an attack on, you know, you know, IT systems for billing and once again back to the money. You know, they, you know, they, they could have kept the, the products flowing, but they, they wouldn't know who to charge, so they stopped. Yeah. Well, they charged me an hour and a half to fill up my tank of gas up in the north. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, you know, you asked, you know, what should we be doing to raise awareness? And it would be really nice if we could speak to successful defense. And, you know, you, I, I like the example of uh, Y2K, right? Because you know, I was one of the people involved in preparing for Y2K. Probably a lot of us were, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, it, it, when people said, oh, it was a nothing burger, right? You know, you know after there, you know, nothing really terrible happened, right? I felt, you know, it's, it's a letdown. I was like, yeah. no, wait a minute. We saw the bridge might crumble, and we shored it up, and then it didn't fall down, right? Mm -hmm. That was a success. Yeah. And, and being able to speak to shoring up, right? Showing people the success story, right? This is a success story. And I think we're seeing the same thing in the cyber domain, right? Yeah. Where it's like, okay, we're actually paying attention now. We're doing a better job of defending things. We weren't attacked, or no attacks were successful. That's, that, that should be described as a success and interpreted that way, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's the same way, you know, say, the Secret Service. I mean, a president hasn't been shot in 30 years, so why are we spending all that money? Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> well, this is, this is actually a very big problem uh, to quantify. So, for instance, spending premiums on insurance. Well, we haven't had a fire in 30 years, so why are we spending so much for insurance when we're not going to have a fire? Is really a failure in thinking, and we haven't really brought that into the cyber realm yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be an important aspect. I think one of the things David brought up um, is, is one that is beginning to drive more awareness, which is privacy. We want to have good security for better privacy, but integrating that into an environment where 
violating privacy generates income for advertising um, is going to be a challenge, at least in the U.S. Well, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, we talk about, you know, once again, 30, 40 years, these systems have not been designed with security in mind. So now we're designing it with security in mind, and we're noticing the privacy impacts of the, the, the systems that weren't designed for security or privacy. Now we have to start making some trade-offs. Um, so, you know, some one of those, it's, uh, you know, if you are um, unintentionally collecting, you know, personal identifiable information and then throwing it away, um, if you can really throw it away, and that's, that's the part, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so he said, "Well, I don't, I don't trust that you're that you're not using it. So now we can't collect it. Okay, well, if you don't collect it, then we lose a lot of very exquisite security type data. And you know, so which would you, you know, rather be, uh, um, you know, your privacy, but uh, in insecure transactions that will lead back to your privacy again uh, anyway? So, um, once again, it's an education. Not how do we, um, you know, make sure that we can make those decisions." Um, you know, with the entire society, you know, um, adding some value to it as opposed to just, you know, technocrats like us deciding what's good for the rest of the community. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a goal. I want to learn more about the Tim Berners-Lee solid interrupt proposal. As, uh, are you familiar with this? No. no. Uh, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, the guy that did, you know, the mm -hmm. web standards a uh, yeah. long time ago, uh, you know, has a, is working on like a next generation internet to um, the idea that you know, people own their own data and uh, basically can provide access control to third parties on, on their own data so that like uh, you could have a government registered identity and then you populate your, your, your data and, and then you allow third parties access to this data. So you manage it and you control access to it. And then I'm not sure how copying is dealt with, mm -hmm. right? Because it seems like you can make a copy of the data. But at least, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think the privacy issues are way deeper than anything I talked about, right? Yeah. I, and something like uh, real next generation technologies like uh, this uh, solid, I think is the name of the, like the, the Tim Berners-Lee proposal. And, you know, I, I think, you know, like it, it needs to be, it's more than the transport protocol we need to be concerned about. It's like the, the, the whole architecture around the data. We, we, we have some people that are actually looking at privacy in the metaverse and try to think of that. And, and uh, we, we make these uh, AR, VR headsets. Uh, and they're, they're really designed for our gaming division, but we found out they can be used for a lot more than gaming. Like, like in, uh, if, you, if you take the algorithms that have been developed that are tracking eye movements, they can also track your pulse rate, they can track your blood pressure, they can sense, if you're in a gaming environment, how you're reacting to mm -hmm. the game. And based on your reactions, you can shift to another part of the software to enhance or to, you know, to take the stress off, depending on uh, how the player wants to play. Yeah. But, but you can do this in a classroom situation where you can monitor in a virtual classroom when the computer monitor, you can monitor pulse rate and blood pressure. You can monitor whether somebody's paying attention. There are 53 muscles in the face. You can track the muscle movement. And you can actually accurately predict over 90%, and the lab says 98%, so I think you got to cut that back by about 10% to get a real number, uh, but the, uh, what the emotional state of the student is. Mm -hmm. Are they paying attention? Did they understand the concept right. that you just presented? Mm -hmm. And talk about privacy. I mean, you're, you're looking mm -hmm. inside somebody's head yeah. when you do yeah. that. Yeah. And so we yeah, have you, merged. You're, fi you're finding out things they don't know themselves. They don't yeah, they <laughs> not even thought of. It, it's, it's still subconscious mm -hmm. and hadn't moved up yet. Uh, but we have merged our cybersecurity affinity group, which is a collection of, of about 300, maybe 400 people that are focused in cybersecurity in our company. And they get together every couple of weeks and they trade stories. Here's what I'm working on, here's what I'm doing. It's just so uh, in a matrixed organization, you're not cut out or left out on the wings. You're in touch with what the company's doing. We merged the cyber group with our privacy group. And, and privacy group much smaller, 20 to 50 people, but you realize that the issues are very common, just from different perspectives. And the thing the cyber people are talking about, the privacy people are interested, and vice versa. And I think that was, you know, somebody brought it up and we said, we'll give it a try. And that was probably the best thing we could have done for the collaboration. Well, uh, I don't need VR to increase the stress level of my class. Oh, yes. so, uh, <laughs> so you're, you're a good professor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Experience gives me that. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, if any of you uh, have a question you'd like us to consider, please queue up there at the microphone. I'll, I'll call on you. 
Um, another aspect here that ties in with some of the security and privacy that we're beginning to see is we've had this issue of global supply chains and standards. But what's happening, uh, there's hardware certainly that over 50% of our chips are produced in Taiwan. So if the PRC decides this week is the one they want to take Taiwan back, we have a problem. Uh, but from a software perspective, and, and certainly Cisco, HP, uh, produce a lot of software that we right. use. We're seeing with both economic uh, sanctions against Russia, uh, uh, Iran, there's a lot being developed locally. PRC is developing their own network, their own protocols. We're balkanizing the network and we're losing a lot of that interoperability uh, as a result of political pressure and some economic pressure. Um, what does this portend for our overall security and privacy posture going forward? And let, let's go just down the line. Well, Zach? Well, you know, it, it's kind of interesting, you know, on one level, um, you know, so about, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, we were doing a, um, a project for a consortium called Logic, an oil and gas consortium. And, uh, and we were looking at the integration of safety and control. And one of the other uh, vendors, um, because they were all smart engineers, had decided to write their own TCP IP stack mm -hmm. instead of using one that had been you know, used and vetted. And let me tell you, new software is full of bugs. <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, is there going to be a, 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 a Chinese equivalent of Swift and a Chinese equivalent of other things? It's going to take them a long time to get it right where they can trust that it is as good as uh, what they were using before. So, so that's one interesting aspect. I also, but from our own perspective, a lot of the offshoring that had been done, um, both with manufacturing and with software, you know, coming back in, um, is going to be coupled with things like our, our new software bills of materials, um, um, yeah. digital or hardware bills of materials, and okay, um, and and because of all these different things, I, I have developed something called a federated uh, bill of materials, and I'll I'll leave it to you to work on the acronym, <laughs> but it, it gives you a, a, a chance to you know you know put these things together in in ways that combined with new um, you know training and education on secure development on uh, cyber informed engineering that I hope the uh, the Secretary of Energy will be signing out soon that can bring us uh, to a lot better systems you know when we when we get to talking about workforce you know. You know, like, oh, a million jobs, half of whatever the number is, we're never going to hire and train our way out of uh, the, the problem of cybersecurity. We just have to make, um, you know, more secure systems um, that are easily monitored, um, that protect privacy, you know, from the beginning. And, and it'll take us 50 years to replace all the legacy, but at least we'll see a path. So uh, I like software bill of materials, and I like testing. And I think testing is, is underrated, right? That Un underappreciated like so NIST is doing something new automated crypto validation protocol to add like automated testing so you can take a crypto module and have it run through all the battery of tests and and then when you realize oh wait there's a bug I have to fix it and then you fix the bug and you can revalidate use, using a, you know, like basically a cloud service right so this like automation around testing is that that's that's the way to go because I, I don't trust the people who implemented it until it's tested <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll speak on the hardware side, and, and your expertise in software uh, makes sense. Uh, the hardware side, uh, I, I serve on the, uh, I'm one of the voting members for the Department of Homeland Security Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force, and I chaired the Threat Evaluation Group, which we started three years ago, and that reports out, and they've asked me to chair the Hardware Bill of Material, which, if, once again, you can use your own name, H-bomb yeah. in the middle of a war sounds right, right, ominous, that, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, but the, you've got to think of hardware and software bill of materials at the same time. So I attend all the S-bomb meetings and their uh, chairs attend all my meetings. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, at least we're in the same wavelength, uh, but they're different problems. Yeah. They're different problems that I think the hardware is much easier. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but it's still just as critical. Back to the chip manufacturing, and you mentioned Taiwan and TSMC, and I was supposed to go over there next week uh, with the National Defense University, and they canceled the trip. So they're coming out to Palo Alto. We're going to tour them around Silicon Valley, but the follow-on trip to Taiwan just thought, you never know when the shoe's going to drop. Right. I think they would have dropped it a month ago, the same day the Russians invaded Ukraine, if they were going to do it anytime soon. But uh, 
China values its economic security more than uh, they value their relationship with Taiwan, is my conclusion. And if you look at where they're made, I'm not as worried about where the chips are stamped out as to where they're designed. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's the design of the chip is where the risk factors are. It's where you put the back doors in. It's how you can attack the chip itself because the manufacturing of the chip is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's a complex, very delicate, very hard thing to do, but it's a straightforward. Thing. And where's the threats in the manufacturing versus threat in design? Well, well, you know, but, you know, on, on one level, you know, there, though, and um, I, I know Purdue is uh, a member of this new Cyber Manufacturing Innovation Institute, um, trying to, you know, validate that, yeah, that design actually, you know, did get to the chip manufacturer uh, with this level of integrity, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, and the way they designed it. So, so I think that, um, you know, it may be designed in, in Seattle, right. but by the time it gets across a wire and into um, that machine, if it's interdicted and, uh, and a change, a subtle change yeah. made, so there's, there's both sides of it. Yeah. Right? If you hash it at the design point, then you validate the hash before you go yeah. in production, you have some certainty. Yeah, you've you got to get more complex than yeah. that, though. You know, I, you know, guys like David have figured out the hash thing. <laughs> <time ago. laughs> I, I, I sort of want to uh, follow up a little bit on what you started with. You're talking software bill of materials. And, and just I'm going to push back on that and say that's not really a solution for some of the problem. Um, last week, I, I did a poll on InfoSec Twitter. Right, and, and uh, uh, what I said is you're, you're on a plane and the pilot announces we have our new software, uh, Agile Design, and we can download from a repository and update if anything happens. And you're a passenger on this plane, what do you do? Yeah, well, the, the number one choice by, I gave a limited set of choices, but <laughs> the number one choice by far was make sure my will is up to date. <laughs> um, so we have, we may know of uh, a thing that's in the software, mm -hmm. but how it's developed mm -hmm. is a real problem. Our, our overall software development process moved away from design into more, you know, let's do things and, and then patch it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite quotes is, is software that, that hasn't been specified can never be wrong, it can only be surprising. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we, we have a lot of surprises. Um, how do we also get back into better software design that meets our security and privacy goals? I mean, that, that's also a supply chain issue. Where do we go? It is. It is. Yeah, well, you know, I, I talk about that, you know, cyber-informed engineering again, um, that should be linking to secure software development. You know, they're, they're, I, hate, I hate standards on one level because, you know, the, the nice thing about standards is everyone can have their own. Um, and so with, with software, it's kind of the same way. And I, I want to make sure that, that all the software developers for, for my, my different hardware are, are using the same standard, not, not their own, and coming to a, a level. But I think that's, that's something that we have to learn. I think some of the metadata that SBOMs will be able to collect uh, will talk about the level of uh, rigor um, in the software development application uh, framework that those uh, folks are using. And I think that uh, as we start developing some of those uh, standards, um, we'll be able to pick and choose suppliers uh, that are more apt to, uh, to produce you know, good code. Yeah, mandatory standards are called regulations. Mm. So that's the, you get into the regulation field and boy, yeah. there goes innovation right out the door Absolutely. with it. Well, this is certainly, in, in, in uh, cryptography, it's certainly recognized that people who are rolling their own or trying to do their own uh, uh, without a proper guidance uh, generally are making a huge mistake. Um, R rolling their own has some connotations, too. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. those are the ones who very often try. <laughs> try to, uh, yeah. You, you know, I, I think you're right that uh, coding practices are aren't deliberate enough, don't involve enough design. And you know, probably the industry is, is partly to blame, is mostly to blame here, right? Mm -hmm. I think that um, I'd really like to see more attention paid on design and methodologies around design. And um, you, you know, one of the things I always tell people that I, that I work with around software, and I write, I, I write and I work with a lot of software, and to, you know, what's valuable is code that's been reviewed, right? So you can have somebody really smart you know, writes a thousand lines of code, but until like somebody else has actually sanity checked it, right? I mean, it, it shouldn't be trusted, right? So, and then when you take, like you, you build up like, you know, 200,000 lines of code that was been well written and well vetted, 
And then you slap, you know, 5,000 lines of patches in it because, oh, well, we wanted to do this other thing, right? Well, you just invalidated. You, you need to have a process and a review around adding that patch in. You know, so validation is, is code review is, is of primary importance. We should be tracking it. We should be valuing it. And, and if you look at the tools and the methodology and practices, at least the ones that, that, that I've seen, right, I, I don't see enough uh, recognition of this. Well, so, you know, uh, well, I'm sorry, I was going to say, I, I blame Gordon Moore for the state of sloppy <laughs> software. Uh, because back in the 70s, when, when hardware cycles were expensive, you spent a lot of time designing your code, yeah. you know, writing it carefully, bench checking it, because it was going to take you, you know, a half day or a day or more to get one run back, right? You know, and if you needed to have something, you know, developed either commercially or, or for school, and it was due on Friday, and you only, you know, and it was Tuesday, you figure, I have four chances to get this right, mm -hmm. so I better make sure that I have designed my specification, I understand what the requirement is, you know, I, I write it in a language that I can do well. Now, I'm, you know, I can sit at my, my desk and you know, just, just try a thousand things in an hour, just about. Um, and then when I finally get the answer, I can give it to my professor and, you know, you know say it's all done. And it works the same way, I believe, in, in some software development houses. Well, it's certainly the case that if you're first to market, mm -hmm. you have an advantage. Yeah. And that's driven a lot of these methods, the, the just-in-time, the DevOps, the agile programming, mm -hmm. is to turn things around quickly for right. features. Mm -hmm. But we don't really have any penalties in the system yeah, for your, poor quality. Let right. your customers fix your software problems. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, that's the, yeah. The I, I worked for a company that that must have been their motto. That, that's, <laughs> the, that's the shortest um, block on my resume after I realized who I was working for. And, I, you know, and it actually, and don't look me up on LinkedIn. I don't think I even mentioned the name of the company. So. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't remember. When do we? Uh, 15. Did we, we, 15 we after? So we've got time. I'm, I'm not seeing anybody. Well, Jumping up here to ask questions. Oh, uh, maybe that's a cue. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so I used to say that, uh, you know, if there are students out there that didn't have questions, they obviously aren't, um, you know, they aren't engaged. Yeah. I won't do it. <laughs> and I can prove it with the software. Mm -hmm. So, in theory, the next release of NIST 800 161 is immediately in, in queue to be released. So it's close. how much of the issues are you, are you going to address? Because th the second release was almost a total rewrite from the initial yes. uh, uh, release. So uh, could you comment on where you think you're going, what you've solved, and what's left to be solved? Yeah, I, I, let me say something about NISC. And I, I know a lot of you out there have interface and work with them. but I. I think they're one of the best run agencies in government today. Now, I was very close with Walt Copen, who was the last director at NIST, previous administration. Walt and I serve on the uh, U.S. Council on Competitiveness, and for some reason they always put us next to each other at all the meetings. And uh, he does a great job of getting industry, government, and academia together at NIST to discuss issues. And they do not publish anything until all issues or complaints are resolved. They have an answer. So they come to a collaborative understanding. And that's why, you, you know, I was fussing at Walt last uh, two years ago. Uh, you know, you've got to get some of these new crypto modules out, the quantum uh, resistant encryption. We, we've got to be prepared. We need to be prepared now, and we're losing time. And he says, we don't do it that way. We make sure careful, step, deliberate process to adjudicate all this. And when you look at an example of public-private partnership, I think NIST does it right. And so 161 is coming on. Don't know exactly when. I think they're ready 98% to release it today. But they're crossing the I's and dotting the T's. And that's why it takes so long. That's why it takes so long. I'm not criticizing. Yeah. Which one? 161. What's 161? Yeah. I don't have my cheat sheet. I, I don't know, I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so I so I just want to say, you know, it, it's almost like an acronym. Like, you know, we, we lost our cheat sheet and which one is one sixty one? Oh yeah, no, no, it's a supply what what is it? 
Cyber supply chain. I guess I should know that. Okay. Yeah. That's, I, I do that 161, 172 go mm -hmm. close together. Thanks. QE, or the uh, Controlled Unclassified Information, mm -hmm. is really the focus on 172, which gets you into the CMMC discussion of mm -hmm. the cybersecurity uh, maturity model certification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just saying, I had a meeting last week with Paul Nielsen, who's the CEO of Carnegie Mellon's Software Engineering Institute. And Paul and I go way back to when he was a two-star in the Air Force, running the Air Force Research Lab. I was office, uh, at the Office of Naval Research, and we had some collaborations together. And so we were just telling sea stories and rehashing old times. But he reminded me, when I was running a major program to build a SEAL delivery system uh, that had carried 10 SEALs up a river for a week long on a lithium-ion polymer battery, uh, we had some real software problems in that program. And somebody told me I'll go up to Carnegie Mellon and see if they could help. And since the Office of Naval Research was sending about $12 million a year to Carnegie Mellon, you know, I got a lot of help. You yeah. know, that, that'll, that'll wake up some professors over there. And, they, uh, uh, and, and the one thing they were telling me about was McCabe complexity matrix, full path integration testing. Every node and every path that you've validated the software has been through this. And, uh, and when you're looking at McCabe, it, we, we don't call it McCabe anymore. We do have complexity testing. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow McCabe must have get discredited, but his name's right. dropped off. Cyclomatic. Uh, Cyclomatic complexity yeah. is what it's called. Yeah, okay. but, uh, but Paul brought that up. Do you remember when? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you think that, that this was back in 20 years ago, and, and we're, the same issues are still in applying. I, I think... NIST is going to get this out, and they're going to be uh, uh, people that even when it comes out, they're going to start complaining. And the beautiful thing is, they're going to listen to those complaints. Mm -hmm. They're going to evaluate it. They're going to put it out with industry. And you may see a whole other version come out in three years from now. Mm -hmm. It's What's because yeah. they're listening. Mm -hmm. And they're not just ignoring or saying, this is the way we do it. They, they really are facilitating input. Yeah. So if you take the time to make a comment on a NIST document, it will be heard. I, I, I was pushing for 193 to get out, and that's the one on hardware uh, uh, resiliency. You know, what is resiliency? Well, the first thing this does is they spend months just defining the terms. And so in our, uh, our, our scrim task force, whenever there's, well, what do you mean when you say artificial intelligence? Or yeah. what do you mean? Yeah. You know, we default to the NIST definitions because they've done a whole lot of work already just to define the term, so we're all on the same sheet of music. Well, I, th I think something that, that should be borne in mind, and, and often we forget it because we are so focused on near-term issues, is how rapidly our field continues to evolve. So uh, this is one of the things talking with David about when we had our, our uh, visionary workshop 20 years ago. Uh, we said some very provocative things that now in hindsight look, well, of course, like <laughs> always on yeah. uh, technology. And that was not the case 20 years ago. Uh, even a few years ago, if you had talked about public repositories of code, pe people would not have understood what that meant. Mm -hmm. uh, the advent of things like Git uh, mm -hmm. and, and similar packages, um, talking about uh, um, containers and, and uh, similar control, 10 years ago, those were theoretical or in the lab, they weren't out in regular use. So these standards, and, and this is also, by the way, what draw, drives the agile development kind of approach mm -hmm. is because these things are evolving so quickly, but those are really kind of difficult for us to get our hands around because it takes time to understand those and what the implications are. Sure, absolutely. Um, okay. Um, Mark Probasco with uh, Paraton Corporation, my HP. Mom, um, two, two questions. One is, uh, one, I've been on the Navy account for a number of years. One of the issues is when we get the hardware in, uh, it has all the sort of down to the chip level. We have to have the software, the chip levels, all of that. But it's when you get into replacement boards, we have to have who's got the replacement board, yeah. who installed it, you know, and I know you know. Yeah, every day. <laughs> um, I guess I was kind of curious to see where you see that going because that's, you know, we, that, that plays a huge role in the ship. Absolutely. All that. And then the last question is uh, DODAF. 
we once in a while we'll get requests in from the Department of Defense to follow DODAF processes. I'm not sure where DODAF is going and how well cyber is built ago. into that process. And I just wondered if DODAF anybody on the board ago. would have any yeah. insight. I, I'm going to refuse any fine. knowledge of DODAF. Yeah. Yeah. I, thought, yeah. I thought DODAF had gone away years ago. But yeah. okay, no, you know, I thought it had disappeared completely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it, it, uh, it's there to slow things down, yeah. not necessarily to but, but NCOST is doing some really good work in hardware manufacturing. And if you look at the um, uh, NCOST is the National Cyber Center of Excellence that NIST supports as a public-private partnership. And what they've done is, is looking at all the logic-bearing components in your hardware products, and this is not just HP working on the project, but Dell and Lenovo and I think some others, uh, that you're, you're looking at uh, putting a crypto signature on each component and then hashing those signatures together with all the components on there. And if the hash doesn't add up at boot, somebody's manipulated one of the components or added a component, and, uh, and that's problematic from a, a, a tampering point of view. And I think that's going to give you more security that the, uh, the hardware that was built in at manufacturing and shipped is the same one that was delivered on receipt to the customer, and it's the same one being used five years later. Uh, and all the way, we used to call it cradle to, to cradle to grave, grave. Yeah. And, and now our uh, sustainability people say you've got to say cradle to cradle because you're going to take all the things you were going to put in the grave and you're going to reuse them all. Okay. So, yeah. I'm, I'm still Oh, hi. Uh, going back slightly to the uh, Ukraine conflict, I was wondering if you could uh, speculate a little on what a hot cyber warfare, hot war cyber warfare would look like and uh, address a question I sort of have, which is, is Ukraine better prepared for it, having fought it for at least eight years, than we are? Well, c considering that we help train some of the people there, yes, they're better prepared than, than what they were before. Well, they but saw it, well, saw they, it they, coming. I think she asked if they're better prepared than we are. United States, and, yeah. And, oh. Yeah, I, no, I would say no. no they are, they are, they are, well, never mind, I won't answer yeah. that. <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think so, because at least what we found in training them, uh, there, were, there were a number of gaps. Well, and, and it's always back to money. How yeah, much can they afford to spend? Versus. It's a yeah. risk reduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if you want zero risk, you're going to spend infinite dollars. It, it's a correlation. And, and so Ukraine had limited resources. And we were trying to train them from an intellectual point of view. But they still have people, and people are money. And they had limits of what they could do. And, and we have limits ourselves, not as many limits. But the, uh, if you want to read a good book on the cyber war of the future, uh, my classmate at the Naval Academy, Jim Stavridis, became, a, yeah, became an admiral and served at Southern Command. I worked with him there, and then he went on to European Command. I was on an advisory board with him. I have stayed close to this guy. I had no clue he could write a novel like this. Yeah, but it, it's, it doesn't go into the details of how the cybers operated, but it is a scary story that if we don't do something now about protecting cybersecurity in uh, military warfare, we're going to be in big trouble by 2034. And it's called 2034, a novel of the next uh, world war. Uh, the next cyber war. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and actually tomorrow's closing keynote, Dick Clark mm -hmm. has written several books on this. Absolutely. He has. And, yeah. and he is so, really good uh, too. That, that yeah. would be, uh, I think his talk, he will talk about that, about how we're in a hybrid war right now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll ask another question here as, as we've sort of cleared the queue, uh, we're seeing increased interest. I would say a lot of it, I would say a lot of it is hype, um, as well as interest in AI writ large. Um, I, I don't believe there is artificial intelligence, but there is certainly a lot in machine learning and, and uh, uh, machine recognition. Um, we're getting to a point probably past it, where some decisions are being made and we don't know why. We have systems that we're designing that are doing things and we're not sure why. Mm -hmm. And people are talking about using those for security. What does that portend for us as a field uh, on, the, on the trajectory we're on? Yeah, I was going to make the joke about there might not be as much natural intelligence as there was 50 years ago. But, um, <laughs> um, and so, so, yeah, so people need to understand kind of the, the progression from, you know, autonomous systems to, you know, um, automated systems, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I think that um, 
we need to get ahead of what um, AI will do for us, those, uh, those um, highly autonomous systems. Um, we worked on a uh, task with um, uh, California, the California Energy Security for the 21st Century. And uh, we developed a machine-to-machine -machine automated threat reduction system. You know, you know, fast, faster than you know than human speed, et cetera. And uh, and when briefing it to the C-suite, uh, you know, one of the officers in there was like, well, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable, you know, with an AI, um, you know, running the grid. And the CEO said, yeah, neither am I, but it's coming. And so we need to start now understanding what that means. And I think that's what uh, you know is really the problem now. So um, you know, you know, military guys, we used to always talk about the OODA loop or humans in the loop. I think we're at the point now where we have to just uh, have humans on the loop. Um, those uh, autonomous systems need to have boundaries. Um, you know, I, I liken it to you know, the teenagers. Okay, you know, you know, come home by ten. If you're not going to come home by ten, give me a call and I'll give you a new set of uh, you know guidelines. So you know, as, as these autonomous systems are approaching their limits, uh, they should be able to talk to that that human, you know, absolute decider and say, hey, I'm seeing something that's outside of my purview. Do I? turn it over to you, or are you going to give me some extra instructions? Um, but until we uh, understand exactly, you know, what the, uh, um, our capability to make uh, an artificial intelligence or an autonomous system, you know, that's, uh, that's trustworthy, um, then uh, I'll, I'll be the last one to have a, a car like that. I'll argue that humans are in the loop. It's where they're in the loop. Mm. The loop may be at the beginning when they're writing the code for the automatic system. And, and yet they're making decisions on those limits, mm -hmm. on those constraints, and combining that in the software. And that may be imperfect, it may have flaws, it may be problematic, and that's why you do the testing mm -hmm. uh, before you go live, before you put it on automatic system. But it, it, it's not that the AI isn't understood. Uh, uh, you, you know, Bayesian belief network, they're well understood, it easily explain the process and the math, uh, but you, you go into some of the de deep learning techniques, well, you may not be able to say how the math got to that answer, but you know the process it took to get there. Mm -hmm. So is that well enough understood to say I trust it? The answers are not going to be perfect, but are they better than what you have today? Uh, the speed you brought up, Zach, is critical. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you want the Superman approach, you know, faster than a speeding bullet, well, you know, our response time has got to be faster than the speeding bullet. Mm -hmm. It's got to be faster than Superman. Mm -hmm. And to do that, the human has to be in the loop at the beginning, not in the middle of the process, or you've lost already. Mm -hmm. David, you were talking about using machine learning for some of the observation and detection. Yeah. What, what are you seeing there? So um, I think ar artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, in, in recent memory, have really been oversold. And, and in particular, you, you know, when you look at machine learning or AI, you can, there's interpretable, which is like there's a model that is simple enough that a person can understand it. And then there's like the non-interpretable, which is like, you know, there's a neural network which, you know, when I train it on this data, it gets really good results when I test it on that data, which is no <laughs> yeah. guarantee in the real right, world, right? right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, during the, I don't know, the last uh, 10 years, right, like if, if, if you pay attention to the Gartner hype cycle, right, I think that's, uh, there's some good insight in that, right? So with the, I, I don't know, machine learning is somewhere on the, uh, the, the I, I, I forgot all the jargon in the, in the hype cycle. It's like the, we're, we're headed into the trough of disillusionment or something like that, according to them. Mm -hmm. but, but there's an intuitive understanding that's hard to get with math when it's very complex math. I mean, you're, you're talking about nonlinear dynamics in most of these uh, equations, and chaos theory starts to play in. But when, you're, when you've got an intuition for it, you feel comfortable with it, because you understand how it got to the decision it made. Uh, when it's a process, you either got to believe in the process or you don't, and that's done through repetition. It's, it's proven time and time again, almost like a Monte Carlo simulation, you run it with every possible variable in every possible way, and here's the yeah, statistics. But, but, but it comes you know, up but, with. The, but the state explosion there, it's hard. So, you know, yeah. so um, you yeah. know, a, a friend at uh, the Office of Science at DOE talks right. about the fact that you know he, he doesn't believe in explainable AI. You, know, you can take a, a photo and, uh, yeah. and and give it to to an AI, and it'll tell you you know it's a dog, and you change three pixels. Yeah. And you know, and and it's a person, right? See, and it can explain both sides. Yeah. Right. So you know, and, but, and it may not have been either one. But there, there's so, your bias in that, mm -hmm. and so the data collection decision maybe mm -hmm. where you insert a bias right. that gives you an answer that 
obviously wrong. Or, or once again, your sensor just, you know, in a different light, you know, the same, same object, right? Well, yeah. the, the whole adversarial machine learning, mm -hmm. and th I was thinking about this during your talk as well, is that um, if you have something that's continuing to learn while it's in operation, it can be trained to ignore things that you want it to ignore. Right, yeah. This is a common problem that's been around with intrusion detection yeah. for a while. Oh, yeah. But really, the whole notion of adversarial machine learning is, is only, I've only heard that term over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's been around longer, but we're getting so to that point. There's, um, I want to make sure to, to, to be clear on the, the AI and ML, right? I'm, I'm a big fan of AI and ML, as long as it's like simple and interpretable. And we can feel, you know, the, the people who designed it understands, like, if it gives you this answer, I can tell you why it gave you that answer. And th that's really, it's the best way to handle large volumes of data, right? So we totally should be invested in that. But then there's, like, other categories of AI and ML, which are, like, too complex. Mm -hmm. And we should reject people who propose, like, uh, you know, using something that uh, is, isn't interpretable. There is a professor whose name I cannot recall, but she publishes in the natural sciences, and she is on a campaign of uh, re reject explainable AI and embrace interpretable machine learning. Mm. And so I don't want to like misstate her, but this mm. what there's a lot of really valid points around this. Ex there's this explainability paradigm that's been introduced, which is, is something like this, right? I have this data, I'm going to analyze it with some ML thing, and it's really complex, and I don't understand why it works, so I'll build like a simpler version of the complex thing to explain what the complex thing is thinking when it tells you something, right? So instead of like taking a, the, the approach of saying, no, 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 we're going to go with an interpretable model, instead it's like, no, I'm going to build a second thing, second complex thing to explain the first complex thing. And, and then, so, uh, I think she builds a good case in the natural sciences, and I, I think we should be paying attention to it in cybersecurity. Well, you know, I think part of the other you know thing we have is you know continuous learning, um, which, which we all talk about. If uh, um, you know you have a self-driving you know vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, and it comes across a situation that it doesn't understand, and the human takes over, then now learns. And so once again, I go back to you know you know anyone here who has uh, you know raised children or you know watched uh, some else, someone else raise children, and you you know put all this input and training and everything, and then all of a sudden they come out with some random output and said you know where did you learn that? I'm like I don't know, and it was at school or in the yeah. playground or something else. So if you allow a system to continuously learn, you better be watching all of those inputs. Um, as you said before, you know AI tainting and others, uh, because you're going to get unexpected results because the learning continues. I, I saw a really good example uh, two days ago online from someone about training up a system to recognize with, it was semantic, it wasn't particular data, but that uh, defining a chair as uh, something people sit on that has a back and four legs. Mm -hmm. um, that's a horse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, and so thinking about somewhat outside the box of the definitions and, yeah. and yeah. Uh, that leads us into some interesting directions, which we don't have time to explore because we've sort of hit the end of our time. I think we could probably go on in this for, for uh, quite a bit longer. But um, Zach, you said you have to leave a little bit early, but you're around tomorrow to give a talk. So uh, I would encourage all of you, uh, if you have a chance, maybe at lunch, to uh, uh, follow up with any of uh, the panel here that you're interested in talking to. Thank you so much for your attention, and now we go to a break.